بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيد الأولين والآخرين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد The death of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم struck the Ummah like nothing that ever took place before or after It was the greatest calamity that has ever taken place in the Ummah of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and it is the standard according to which other fitan could even be compared. Rasulullah said, When one of you is afflicted, is inflicted by a calamity, let him remember how he was afflicted by my death. For indeed, that is the greatest of all calamities. The death of Rasulullah The thing is that we cannot really imagine how much and how deep the love of the Sahaba was for their beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the center of their society. He was the center of their lives. Everything revolved around obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the heart in the middle of their body. And the, his commands was like blood flowing through their veins. He was the epicenter of everything that they stood for. So when he dies, someone so pivotal and so important, so charismatic and so merciful, every single one of them felt as though the relationship between him and Rasulullah was so great that he was their best friend. That yes, I might not be Abu Bakr, but Rasulullah the way he treats me, I feel as though I'm his best friend. Even though there were those who were even more beloved to Rasulullah than the average Sahabi. And so when they learned of the death of Rasulullah they reacted in ways that we have never before or after seen from the Sahaba. Maybe from Omar, we'll get to him inshaAllah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu at this time was on the outskirts of Medina. And he was visiting one of his wives because he had two wives. One of them was on the outskirts and one of them was in the center of Medina. But the one on the outskirts he hasn't visited in some time because he was tending to Rasulullah during his sickness. So when Rasulullah appeared to be getting a little bit better shortly before he died, he asked for permission to go to the outside of Medina to see his other wife. And Rasulullah granted him permission. So. Rasulullah died when Abu Bakr was on the outskirts of Medina. So it took him some time to get there. And in the meantime, we see the reactions of the other Sahaba. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, he couldn't even understand, he couldn't grasp that someone like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could die during his lifetime. He took it for granted that Rasulullah would probably outlive him, that he would die before Rasulullah sallallahu So he couldn't grasp that now, after living with Rasulullah sallallahu for almost 20 years of being a pious follower, now Rasulullah sallallahu is dead. What's left now? What type of a, a central leader, a figure like that is left after the greatest creation of Allah was with us and now he's not? It's a striking contrast, a great Great change between the before and after. That once Rasulullah is out of the picture, it's a whole different mood. It's hard to continue. Imagine if someone loves their father or their mother, and then unfortunately or Allah wills that that person is taken. You know, the father or mother reaches an old age and he dies or she dies. That may, individual may have had a great relationship, but now he's scarred as though something is missing. A part of him is missing. That someone they knew for their whole lives, and now... It's as if a section of their lives is just gone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the Sahaba was more than that. In fact, the Sahaba would be willing, and they did. Sometimes they even went against their parents in order to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An example, extreme example is the Battle of Badr. When Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, he even killed his own father because of the stance that he took against the Muslims and because they were at war. But he stood by Rasulullah to the end. So this is the striking contrast between when Rasulullah was amongst them, they felt like the whole world couldn't conquer them. But when Rasulullah was dead and he left them, there's that great feeling of something's missing.
something's just not right. And the reactions were astounding. Umar ibn Khattab, he said, he, Rasulullah he didn't die. He did not die. Rasulullah is still alive. And just like Musa salam went up and spoke to Allah, Rasulullah similarly went up and he's with Allah right now. And he will come back after 40 days and he will cut off the hands and the feet of the hypocrites who said that he died. That was Umar ibn Khattab. A very harsh reaction from the one who was most harsh and stern for the sake of Allah. Uthman ibn Affan was a very shy Sahabi. And his personality was not like that of Omar. He didn't make a huge scene like that. But rather he did the exact opposite. He went by himself, he sat down, and he was mute. He didn't say a single word. Silence. He didn't say anything. He couldn't even talk. He lost the ability to talk. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu he went, he didn't see anybody, didn't look at anybody, didn't talk to anybody. He went into seclusion. Very different reactions from different Sahaba. And this whole time, Omar radiallahu anh, he is in the masjid and he is waving his sword back and forth and he's saying, anybody who says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dead, is going to have his head disconnected from his shoulders. That was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh. So, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he comes back from his wife's house on the outskirts of Medina. And he looks at the greatest calamity that ever took place in this ummah. But he sees the great fitna that has erupted in Medina. And he walks right past it. He walks past Omar, he walks past the Sahaba, he walks past the crying and the tears. And he goes right into his daughter's room, Aisha radiallahu anha. And he sees the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he goes and he kisses the forehead of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he says, "May my mother and father be sacrificed for you, Ya Rasulullah." Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How can we hear about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi in this context and not say sallallahu alaihi wasallam? May my mother and father be sacrificed for you. By Allah, wallahi, Allah will not combine two deaths for you. That's a refutation of Omar because Omar said that just like Rasulullah is dying now, he's going to come back and die again. Abu Bakr said, you're only going to die one time. That time is right now. You're going to die once and this is it. You are now with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not going to die again. And then he goes out back to the masjid and he says to Omar ibn Khattab who is shouting and yelling and threatening all the Muslims, Omar, sit down ya Omar. Omar doesn't even pay attention. He goes, keeps swinging his sword back and forth. And he continues threatening and yelling and screaming. And Abu Bakr, radiallahu anh, he goes, gets on the mimbar, and he gives his own speech. So when the Sahaba saw Abu Bakr speaking, they left Omar, and they go to the number one Sahabi, Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anh. And he gives an amazingly short, precise, concise Excellent to the point statement. And he says, after he praises Allah, مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ Whoever used to worship Muhammad, then verily Muhammad is dead. But whoever worships Allah, then Allah is alive and does not die. Abu Bakr radiallahu recited the ayah of Allah, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلِ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبِتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيَجِزِ اللَّهُ وَسَيَجِزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ Umar ibn Khattab, when he heard it, his knees began shivering and shaking. And after that huge performance in front of the people, that threatening appearance that he put out, he fell on his knees and he fell to the ground because it hit him. When Abu Bakr made it so clear, it hit him. And the Sahaba would go and take that ayah 
And they would advise each other, and everyone would repeat the ayah until the whole city of Medina was chanting the ayah of Allah that Abu Bakr had said. And they said, by Allah, wallahi, it's as if the people of Medina didn't even know that this was in the book of Allah until Abu Bakr informed them of it. Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah said, this ayah, as well as this incident, is the strongest proof of Abu Bakr's bravery. If bravery is defined as having a firm and steadfast heart during times of hardships and calamity, and there was no calamity that was greater than the death of the Prophet wasallam, The people said that the Messenger of Allah wasallam has not died, and among them was Umar. Uthman lost the ability to speak, and Ali went into seclusion. Utter chaos was on the verge of breaking out. But Abu Bakr radiallahu an brought calmness to the situation with this ayah. So the Sahaba radwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in, they didn't even bury the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam until they chose for themselves a leader. Until they chose the first Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this shows you the prioritization that they gave to choosing a leader and why it was important. Because when you have one leader, it unites the Muslims. It makes everybody subservient to the same individual who rules them according to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you have this one leading and this one leading and everybody, basically anarchy, then there's no unity whatsoever. It's complete division, every man for himself, virtually. Some of the muhajireen, including Abu Bakr and Umar, they began talking about who should be the first khalifa. And while they were talking and discussing, they heard that the Ansar were also discussing the same topic amongst themselves. So the two tribes of the Ansar, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, they met together in the courtyard of Ben Sa'idah. And they began discussing the matter amongst themselves. So at first it was both tribes together, but then the smaller tribe, Al-Aws, they left. And so it was only Al-Khazraj talking in the courtyard of Banu Sa'idah. So the Khazraj, their leader was Sa'd ibn Ubaidah radiallahu an, one who has great honor in Islam and who led his whole tribe into the submission of Allah so many years earlier. And so he was actually very sick at the time and he was wrapped up in a blanket. So they, nonetheless, they wanted him to be the first Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Muhajireen heard about this and Abu Bakr and Umar heard about this, they left where they were and they went immediately to the courtyard of Banu Sa'idah because they didn't want any fitna to break out. They didn't want the wrong person to be chosen or they didn't want only a fraction of the ummah, the fraction of the community to choose one khalifa and the rest of the ummah to choose somebody else. And therefore, fitna breaking out. So this is a great lesson in fitna prevention. Always consult other Muslims, consult other brothers in affairs that relate to you personally as well as more importantly, affairs that relate to the entire community. So when Abu Bakr and Umar and some of the Muhajireen walked in, the Ansar, Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in, they spoke first and they praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they said, we are the helpers of Allah. We are the Ansar and the battalion of the religion. We are the ones who defend this deen in military situations. While the Muhajireen are only few, and this is actually reality. The Muhajireen were only a couple hundred, 200 Saman Muslims who migrated from Mecca to Medina, while the Ansar were the vast majority of the inhabitants of the city of Medina, and therefore they were the vast majority of the Ummah before it began spreading to other cities as well. So then they said, because of our honors, one of us should be appointed to be the Khalifa. And so they said, Sa'ad ibn Ubaidah radiallahu an, he is the most qualified, he is our leader, and therefore he should be the leader of the whole ummah. Umar ibn Khattab, he was mentally preparing a speech while they were speaking. And he said, I'm going to say this and that and that. When they finished speaking, he was about to start speaking. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he started before Umar got a chance to get into his speech. So he quieted himself because he didn't want Abu Bakr to get mad. And they know Abu Bakr sometimes. He had a little bit of a temper and you don't want to get Abu Bakr mad. So he let Abu Bakr, the greatest Sahabi of them all, he let him speak first. And Umar bin Khattab said that every single thing that I was planning to say in my speech, Abu Bakr said, 
Even though I planned it, he said it on the spot without thinking about it. And what I planned to say, he said more. And he said what I was going to say, he said it better. That was the eloquence that only Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he praised Allah and he said to the Ansar, Every single thing that you said about yourselves is completely true. The Ansar truly do have a great position in Islam. However, there are other hadith which you didn't mention about yourselves. And he even praised the Ansar more with the other hadith that they themselves did not mention about themselves. And he mentioned the great, great virtues of the Ansar. May Allah be pleased with them. One of the hadiths, for example, that Rasulullah said, a sign of Iman is loving the Ansar. Nobody loves the Ansar except a believer. And nobody hates them except a hypocrite. That is the honor and the position of the Ansar in Islam. But Abu Bakr then continued and he said, But the Arabs will never approve leadership in the hands of anyone but Quraysh. Yes, it is true that the Arabs accepted Islam. The entire Arabian Peninsula had become Muslim by the end of the Prophet Sallallahu life. However, there remain some remnants of the Jahiliyyah that they witnessed before Islam, tribalism. And they would not submit themselves politically to anyone except the Quraysh. Because since Ismail السلام, the Quraysh have been the protectors of the Kaaba. And they have been the ones to whom such great esteem has been attributed. And they have been honored because of their protection of the Kaaba and their maintenance of the holy side of even what was considered in during Jahiliyyah, the holiest side on earth. They would not submit themselves in power politically to anyone except from Quraysh. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he reported that Rasulullah said that this affair belongs to Quraysh. And he even said, don't you remember, Ya Ansar, don't you remember when Rasulullah said this? And they said, yes, we remember when he said this. So they affirmed that the matter, this affair, in other words, the Khilafah, it belongs to Quraysh. And that the Khalifa must be from among the tribe of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, I would be fully satisfied if you gave bayah to either of these two men. And he pointed to Abu Ubaidah and Umar bin Khattab radwan allahi alayhima. Al-Habib ibn Mundir, he said, what about this? What about if we have one Khalifa from our side and one Khalifa from your side? We have our own and you have your own. And in Umar bin Khattab he said, Verily, two swords cannot fit in the same sheath. So then Umar feared that fitna would break out and that this continued prolonged discussion and, and debate would result in more than one leader. So then he said, Abu Bakr, stick your hand out, Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr stuck his hand out. Umar ibn Khattab placed his hand in the hand of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, and he pledged his allegiance to him. He gave him bay'ah. And bay'ah means that I am going to follow you. I have accepted your position of authority above me, especially in the position of Khilafah. And I am pledging to you that I will follow you as long as you are obedient to Allah. And that you don't command me to do anything against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he says, I give bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And then once he did that, Abu Ubaidah said, Abu Bakr, stick your hand out. He gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And then the Muhajireen, they gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And then the Ansar, they ran. They realized, yes, this is Abu Bakr. They ran to start giving bay'ah to Abu Bakr. So much so that everyone was flocking to give their allegiance to Abu Bakr that they started trampling over Sa'd ibn Ubaidah who was wrapped up in the blanket and <laughs> radiallahu anh, he almost died because they were jumping over him to give bay'ah to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. And later on Umar commented on this incident and he said, I would rather have my head chopped off than to be the emir of a people, to be the leader of a people and Abu Bakr is among them. I would rather be dead than to lead Abu Bakr. And he was number two, he was Umar. But certainly Abu Bakr Siddiq, no human being after him held the same position as him in Islam. Nobody whatsoever. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if the iman of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh was weighed on one side of a scale and the iman of the entire rest of the ummah, that includes the sahaba, the tabi'een, the atba'at tabi'een and everybody else, the entire rest of the Ummah, including Umar, Uthman, and Ali, all of them combined. 
the Iman of Abu Bakr would outweigh the other side. And this will become very clear. You might say, yeah, how is it even possible? We'll give it to him that he had more Iman than Umar, he had more than Uthman. But combined, you're going to see inshallah, as we talk about his early Khilafah, that his Iman in the Sunnah of Rasulullah and his trust in Allah was greater than every other Sahabi combined. You will see that without any grade of grayness. It will be black and white, clear as daylight that Abu Bakr certainly, no doubt about it, had the greatest Iman after Rasulullah sallallahu in this Ummah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't want Khilafah, but he didn't want Fitna to break out. He used to say, I never wanted to be the leader, neither a day nor a night of my life. I never asked it of Allah, neither publicly nor privately. However, I feared that it would be a Fitna if I didn't accept this position, I feared that it would be a division in the Ummah. If too much debate goes on about the same topic, it creates indecisiveness. So in order to have a quick decision, we made Shura to have a complete selection of the best opinions. And we chose the best one according to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, And then we stuck to it. And that was that Khilafah would be given to Abu Bakr radiallahu an. If the discussion dragged on too long, even though it was shura, that would only cause division and fitna. The next day, the public gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr radiallahu an in the masjid when he gave his first khutbah as the khalifa. And it is the ijma' of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah that Abu Bakr radiallahu an was the most entitled to be the first khalifa. So the first day of the death of Rasulullah sallam. He died late in the morning. He died late in the morning on a Monday. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he accepted Khilafah privately in the courtyard of Banu Sa'ida the same day, the same exact day. And then on Tuesday, the public gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's masjid. On this day, the people flocked from the outskirts of the city to put their hand in the hand of Abu Bakr and to give him bay'ah. It is clear without any doubt that Abu Bakr was chosen by the entire populace of the Muslims as the one most qualified to accept the Khilafah. So, Shia stories say that Ali radiallahu an, he avoided giving bay'ah to Abu Bakr because he was not entitled to it. However, this is a lie, not only against Abu Bakr, but it is a lie and a defilement of the great Khalifa and the great companion, Ali ibn Abi Talib himself. Why? Because number one, when everybody was giving bayat to Abu Bakr in the masjid, although Ali didn't come right away, he was busy with things that were more important to him personally that he himself as a family member of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to take care of. He was busy with the funeral matters of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he himself washed his body. If he didn't do it, who would do it? You say he is entitled to the khilafah because he was so close to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, therefore because he is so close, shouldn't he have the responsibility of washing the Prophet ﷺ's body? Yes or no? And if it wasn't him, then who do you think should have washed his body? Somebody who was farther away? Someone who wasn't a family member? Look at the arguments that they're saying. They don't make any sense from the beginning all the way to the end. Also, he himself did give bay'ah to Abu Bakr along with all the other Muslims. And once he heard that the people had gathered in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid to give bay'ah to Abu Bakr, even though he was busy, he immediately, he put on a qamis, he put on what we would call a thawb, and he ran into the Masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu immediately from his home, and he gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. So much so, that he didn't even put on a lower garment that would be placed under the qamis, under the thawb. And the people who informed him that there was bay'ah being given to Abu Bakr in the masjid, they grabbed the lower garment for him and they ran up to catch up to him in the masjid to give it to him. And then he put it on in the masjid. So that shows you he ran, he didn't even finish getting dressed. As soon as he heard bay'ah was being given to Abu Bakr, he ran to give it himself. He did not waste any time. So what argument do you have to say that 
Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, his khilaf was unjustified or that Ali did not approve of it. Ali gave him bayah and he rushed to do it too. No doubt about it. Not only that, but if Abu Bakr was the one who was not qualified to receive the khilafa in any way, then look at the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib himself. He is the one who said, Abu Bakr is a sabaq. The one who comes first in everything relating to matters of ibadah. Every single time that the companions of Rasulullah would try to compete with Abu Bakr, he would always come out first. He would beat them in everything. One example is the famous one of the Battle of Tabuk when they were trying to gather funds to support the efforts of the Muslims. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he donated half of his entire wealth. And he said, I want to outdo Abu Bakr just this one time. And then he asks, how much did Abu Bakr give? He was informed that Abu Bakr gave all of his wealth. Rasulullah asked him, what did you leave for your family? تَرَكْتُ لَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ I left for them Allah and His Messenger The Sahaba said after that day, we never tried to compete with Abu Bakr in anything. He would always come out first. And Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu an, he himself, and he was one of the ten given glad tidings of Jannah, he said, no one opposed the Khilafah of Abu Bakr except an apostate or someone who was thinking of apostatizing. And that is the ijma' of Ahl sunnah on the righteous khilafa of Abu Bakr Siddiq. So lessons that we can derive from this incident. Number one is that leadership should be given to the one most qualified in the areas not just of dunya but deen as well. For example, the Muhajirin asked the Ansar during the incident of Banu Sa'ida, Who from among you would want to lead Abu Bakr in Salah? Why is he saying this? Because the leader is the one who leads the people not only in political matters, but in salah as well, in matters of deen and dunya. So they said, who would be willing to lead Abu Bakr in salah? They said, na'udhu billah. We seek refuge with Allah from ever leading Abu Bakr in salah. They couldn't even grasp the idea that one of them should lead Abu Bakr in salah. Therefore, none of them should lead Abu Bakr in this dunya as well. Number two. Leadership should be appointed by shura. It should be selected by mutual consultation amongst the Muslims. They should discuss the matter, not just of leadership, but anything that pertains to the welfare of the Muslims, who is the one who is capable to do this job most effectively, and also has a great rooting in Islam, has Islamic knowledge, and is well capable to lead the people in matters of deen and dunya. It's trustworthy. He is capable in all fields possible. Another lesson we can learn is unity. That they hasten to give their bay'ah to Abu Bakr in order to keep the ummah united. We should always have a leader in whatever groups we are a part of. Yes, there is no khilafah today. But we have various different groups that we as Muslims lead. We have organizations, we have clubs, we have other ways that the Muslims are united in masajid, in Islamic centers. So we should always have one leader, not just a board, not just a board or a committee, but even if we have that, we should have one person who has the final say. Having a leader is the sunnah and it is the command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another lesson that we learn is the importance of khilafah, that the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without doubt, they considered it, Fard, an obligation to have a khilafah. That the ummah in its entirety be united under one leader. Not just one country has a leader, this country has a leader, and at the end you can't even decide what day to celebrate Ramadan or Eid. That's failure. Epic failure. Also, it was more important than burying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You might say, but didn't Rasulullah sallam, he told us to hasten to bury the dead? He's the same one who also taught us to hasten to choose a leader. And that's why they preferred choosing the leader of the Ummah before burying Rasulullah He died on a Monday, they buried him on a Wednesday. Two days before they buried him, in order that they choose a leader. And finally, inshaAllah, Abu Bakr was chosen by the consensus of the Muslims. He was not power hungry, he did not take it from Ali. He even, even Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu he gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. From the moment that everyone broke down in their 
tears and in their anxiety at the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Abu Bakr remained firm and from then it was clear that no one was deserving of leading the ummah except him day 2 the tuesday the first day after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Abu Bakr and Umar were in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's masjid and Umar kept telling Abu Bakr get on the member get on the member to accept the khilaf and give his speech not that it was some type of a prize it was actually a responsibility and that's the confusion that many people have today that leadership positions are some type of an honor and a prestige meanwhile there was responsibility and these people they didn't want leadership we already spoke about how Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu said i never asked Allah ever neither publicly nor privately neither in the day nor the night to have any position of leadership but i only accepted it because i feared any fitna from breaking out Umar bin Khattab he announced to the people that i was wrong the way i reacted yesterday and i said something which has no basis in the quran and the sunnah referring to how he said rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had not died Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu he stepped on the member and he gave his first speech as the khalifa of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he praised allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he glorified allah and then he said to proceed O oh people I have indeed been appointed over you though I am not the best among you if I do well then help me and if I act wrongly then correct me truthfulness is synonymous with fulfilling the trust and lying is tantamount to treachery the weak among you is deemed strong by me until I return to them that which is rightfully theirs inshallah and the strong among you is deemed weak by me until i take from them what is rightfully someone else's inshallah no group of people abandons jihad in the path of allah except that allah makes them suffer humiliation and wickedness does not become widespread among a people except that allah inflicts them with widespread calamity Obey me so long as I obey Allah and his messenger and if I disobey Allah and his messenger then I have no right to your obedience stand up now to pray may Allah have mercy on you that's the whole speech of Abu Bakr Siddiq radhiyallahu anhu barely a paragraph and this is narrated in al bidayah wal nihaya and its chain is authentic walhamdulillah So now we have two major issues that characterize the early khilafa of Abu Bakr Siddiq and his whole khilafa everything that we're going to talk about inshallah is only within 2 years and a few months the two issues number 1 are the apostasy of the arabs they planned to invade medina during this time they rebelled and they left the fold of islam for a number of reasons and number 2 is the army of usama ibn zaid which we will begin with inshallah First of all to understand the time period as soon as the arabs heard that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had become powerful they said we should accept islam because this is the trend this is the new thing to do we don't want to have any conflict with the rising state that is emerging in medina and therefore they sent their people to give bay'ah to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they accepted islam on that basis So then when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam died 2 years later they said all right now he is dead he's out of the picture certainly Medina will erupt in chaos and we don't need at this point to be followers and therefore three types of people emerged number 1 the group that said zakah was no longer obligatory after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they said alhamdulillah we still believe in Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were correct However, we do not see that zakah is binding so long as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is dead. The second group is the one that said, "We completely reject everything that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ever came with and we're going back to worshiping our idols." And the third group is those who accepted false prophets such as Musaylim al-Kadhdhab and Al-Aswad al-Ansi and others. These people who disbelieved in Allah and his messenger, they said, "All right, now The opportunity is golden. There is widespread chaos and now is the correct perfect opportunity to take down the city of Medina while there is chaos. And at this point the entire Arabian Peninsula had disbelieved and rejected Islam except for three groups. Number 1, the city of Medina. 
they stayed firm under the Khilaf of Abu Bakr. Number two was the city of Mecca. And number three, the city of at taif And it actually happened that in at taif they wanted to disbelieve, but then one brave man, he said, O oh, Banu Thaqif, O oh, people of Thaqif, you are the last people to accept Islam. Now, do you want to be the first ones to leave? And so he inspired them and they became steadfast on the path of Islam and they did not fall out of the fold of Islam. And they actually became Muslim after Fath Mecca, very late along the lines of Islam. That's why the army of Usama, which is the next thing we're talking about, was so controversial. Now, just to let you know what it was, Rasulullah before he died, he wanted to send another army out to fight the Byzantine Empire. He sent Usama ibn Zayd to be the leader of this army. He wasn't going to lead it himself, but he appointed Usama ibn Zayd to lead the army to fight the Byzantine Empire, which is a superpower of the world at the time. So the people, they had their reluctance to be a part of this army because they said Usama is only 18 years old. He's a youngster. The likes of Khalid ibn Walid are more likely to lead the army or more deserving, someone who's more experienced, especially this is not a small army, this is not a small mission, we're fighting the superpower of the world at the time. Rasulullah he responded to this and he said, you were reluctant and you had your doubts about his father, Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu an. I loved Zayd and I love Usama, and Zayd was qualified and I love Usama who was also qualified to lead this army. And so, they set up camp right outside Medina during the lifetime of Rasulullah But before it had a chance to set out into the direction of the Byzantine Empire, Rasulullah died. At this point, the people who were outside on the outskirts of Medina gathering to form an army, they came back into Medina. And they attended to the death of Rasulullah and they gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And then Abu Bakr, within days, he said, Usama, go back out and establish camp and everybody else is going to meet you outside. And so these people, they said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he just died. On the outskirts of Medina, the Bedouins are planning to revolt against us and to overtake Medina, considering this their golden opportunity. So we need to worry about the imminent threat from the apostate Arabs rather than worry about an enemy who isn't even planning an imminent attack against Medina right now? What is more deserving of our efforts? The Arabs who can attack us at any moment and we have no second line of defense or an army that isn't even planning to attack us in the Byzantine Empire from a secular perspective. It makes much more sense that the Byzantines are not a threat and that the Arabs were much more threatening to the Khilafa that has just begun. However, that is not in accordance with the Sunnah. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, he was willing to fight to the death if it meant being in accordance with the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi We earlier mentioned his statement that he would not be willing to abandon any of the ways or commands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa out of his fear for deviating. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين